Shall we start? Hello. Yeah, hey, let's start. start. Okay, let's start. Anyway, it'll be recorded. So <coughs> whoever will just have to not be able to ask questions. Haha. <laughs> So okay. this is uh, the last lecture of the semester. Uh, we're happy to have Sai to be able to share with us uh, the second part of her magnum opus. So <laughs> hopefully this would also make sense in the last uh, three weeks of what we're trying to wrap up here in studio. I think to various degrees, I, I walk around a little bit. I think to various degrees, we're all kind of there, you know, at the same spot. So I think it would be very helpful to have this last series of lecture make sense of all these methods that we're doing to give some contextual background as to why we're doing this, what we do, and how that translates into a very real world architecture with the examples that Sai's going to share with us. So whenever you're ready, take it away. Okay. Okay. So we are at the last era and this is the parametric era or whatever complex geometry terms you want to use, right? So basically, we are, it started with Gary, like what Yen mentioned before in her lecture. So we have come from uh, the classical era or the platonic forms where it's just pure uh, geometry, like a circle, cone, you know, and then we, we've gone to the modernist era where it's points, lines, planes, and then we did a little bit of the postmod era, but focusing on local buildings. So you have all the metabolis and utilis, all these terms that you hear, right? So now we are here. So it really <clears throat> started with Frank Gehry's fish, and then the first main major building that he did is this uh, Guggenheim Museum, which is built in 1997, right? So you can already see that this is not a it's not a box, it's not Cartesian, it's not orthogonal geometry, right? So it's made up of very complex curves. And then you have Bilbao. And in, in around the year 2000, so there's a boom in China. So there's a lot of uh, uh, requirement, demand for iconic buildings. So iconic meaning something that looks, a building that looks like uh, something special, okay, to represent maybe for their headquarters. And then you have this uh, national stadium in Beijing designed for the Olympics by Herzog and Demeron, right? So it's part of this era. And this is also when all the internet, social media is happening. So for the first time, you can see, right, this op opening ceremony is viewed by 15% of the world's population. But before that, I don't think this could have happened with just TV broadcast, right? So now we have the internet, we have a lot of, uh, you have your Facebook and things like that, where uh, the image, right? How it looks like is really quite important. So this is the first digital revolution, right? So you will have a lot of architecture that looks like it's parametric, it's made of very complex form. And they are, they are like the iconic building for every city, right? So this is in Azerbaijan. And every city, they want their museum, they want uh, their stadium, their library, you know, to have something like that. So this is by Zaha Hadid. And this is built in 2012, right? And then uh, we, are, we see this construction building, uh, uh, this building under construction, sorry. So you see that the parametric or the technology that started with Gary is mainly being applied to the skin only, right? And then what you see inside is still pretty much a domino house. No difference from this domino house is invented like a hundred years ago, right? So especially, um, and you spend most of your time experiencing architecture from the inside of the building, not outside. And then something you look at from outside, right? Because there's more sculpture. So even with a uh, sculptor like Richard Serra, all the sculptures have become a little bit more spatial, right? Then you question what is architecture and how, so the first digital application, they will, this is the easiest, right? You apply it to some sort of scheme. Um, if you want to apply it to the structure, it's a little bit difficult because it's irregular form. There's gravity, so things might fall and all these things, right? So, but then 
you will see that there's no difference, right? And then if you look at the plan of, this is planned by Gary, right? The Bilbao Museum, you can see that a lot of the curves and things like that, they are happening, it's happening around the facade area. And then in the inside, on the inside, it's just subdivision, right? Then you still get all this Cartesian uh, orthogonal rooms, right? So if you look at the section, you can see that they are still stacked up like the domino house. And then maybe somewhere near the facade, you can experience a little bit this deformation, right? So uh, if you want to conceptualize all this, uh, according to Mario Capo, we can call this the potato era, right? So potato is geometrically complex. If you want to model potato in uh, Rhino, right, then you will have to mark a million coordinates and points, right? So how do we describe uh, not a circle, right? Circle, you just have a, a, a center of circle and radius, and then you can kind of describe, geometrically describe a circle. But then when it comes to something like a potato, so we meant all the odd shaped buildings, right? This would be very difficult because you need a million points in XYZ to form this kind of potato. So then of course, Rhino is invented and this uh, we can describe complex shape by using this thing called curves, right? And then these curves, they form surfaces, right? So these are nerve surfaces. And then you can have, it's always U and V. So as opposed to X, Y, Z for the Cartesian geometry, we now have a series of lines going in one direction called U lines and then the other direction called the V lines, right? And after that, there's this idea of a million section, right? So this is a CT scan of a foot. A foot, your foot is also something geometrically very complex because it's not a cylinder, it's not a sphere, it's not a cube, right? So with the idea of CT scan, right? So you have a complex curve. And then the idea is that you can extract one, a million, as many as you want um, sections to then describe this complex geometry. Right, so something like that. If you look at this, this is a very, this is constructed. Uh, this is the curves, the nerve surfaces. And then if I abstract a lot of contour lines, then I will get a lot of sections. Then I can build something like that, that can then describe this geometry, this complex geometry, right? So tied to Rhino is pretty much this idea. So here on the leftmost, you have the, the in equal interval UV curves describing the, 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 the surface. And then this surface also can be converted into something called a mesh, right? So a mesh is something where all the sides are straight lines instead of curves, right? So with the mesh, you can describe any odd shape geometry, right? So, um, and of course it's 3D, it's not just a 2D plane, right? So most of the time, if you imagine this is a building, right? So you are actually describing uh, the cladding of the building, right? So a lot of early application of um, Rhino and things like that, they are, it's only changing the cladding, right? So with different resolution for the mesh, you can achieve uh, different refiners, right? So like for this one, the last one, you'll see the shape of the rabbit a little bit more, right? So that's, this idea of resolution of this mesh, right? Then of course, in later years, you can have more advanced nerve uh, surfaces describing the surface of this mesh, right? So, okay, so, okay, we are done with the era where this parametric thinking is just applied to the cladding and the shell of the building, right? But you, if you look at the building as a animal, right? So we are, how do we get to the structural? Because at the end of the day, you're not just looking at the building, you spend most of the time inside the building, right? So let's say giraffe versus an elephant, right? So walking through the body, inside the body of the giraffe versus an elephant would be very different, right? And this is the maximum impact of architecture, right? So in 205, there's this uh, Herzog and De Meron design this, uh, the Young Museum in San Francisco, right? So of course, the facade is made of 7,200 pieces of unique 
cladding, right, with different perforations and, and balls and things like that, right? So that's already quite common in that era. But if you look at the plan, um, they're going to do something here, right? So if uh, you can see that this plan is not a really orthogonal, that's uh, the idea of grid, idea of geometry is not really applicable here. So how do you describe the governing principles of this plan, right? So one way is thinking about dynamic forces and material, right? So this is thinking about how the voids are solid and then it's kind of compressing the spatial, the programmatic part of the buildings, right? So you get three bands of programs so-called, right? So this is, uh, so you can see how the solid, um, it's just conceptualizing the geometry, right? So if not grid, if not uh, platonic geometry, how do we invent new geometry and therefore new architecture, right? Another way is to, they are looking at circulation in terms of tension. So uh, forces in architecture, you have compression, then you have tension and shear, right? These three main forces, right? So if you imagine having elastic band uh, crossing, and this would be where, things like circulation and people cross between the bands, right? So this is drawing some, again, thinking about elastic band, right? Organizing this um, building. And the last one is this uh, shear, shear force, right? So if I take all the important spaces in the building and then they can actually be compressed into a square and then this two, they will shear diagonally Right, and why this study? So you get something like that, right? So this volume and the opposite volume kind of sharing each other. And why, and this is the, trying to decode the, the geometry of the tower, right? So the tower that is above the building is actually not a rotation, right? So at, as you go up the tower, the plan, this is the first floor, the lowest floor, and then to the right is the, the shear forces, right? So you get this, this geometry. So instead of getting a rectangle that is rotated around the lift core, right, you have a shear kind of forces, right? So all of a sudden, so that's the tower in the background, right? So for the first time, then the idea of uh, dynamic uh, forces is being applied to spatial organization is not just a facade like how it looks like right but it's applied inside right and with uh, the creation of software like Maya and all this you you hear like block right Maya being able to create blobs and all these things right you there are forces there are, these are virtual materials that before wasn't used to create architecture. Right, so if you think of classical architecture, it's a, it's a block of rigid material that you then carve, right? You carve out a sphere, you carve, carve out a cube or something like that, right? And then the, the materials that we use for modernists will be like uh, points, lines, plane, right? So planar material or they are like members, steel members, right? For these trusses. Then all of a sudden now we are actually using materials that that's dynamic, so elastic band, something that is being can be compressed and things like that, right? So this is this is the next phase. Then okay, so this all happened very fast. So you can see 1997 Gary, and then now we are in 2005, right? And this building is already built, right? So what's next, right? So the next phase would be this topological form to space, right? So what am I saying, right? So for this, we stop a little bit. Uh, we've been studying a lot of Western architecture and history. So um, here we will come, we'll start with Japan, right? So Japan is on a different trajectory, but somehow at this current moment, I think the East and the West, they are kind of colliding, right? So in 1995, around the time when Gary built Bilbao, the Ito built this Sendai media tech, right? So what is he trying to do? So this diagram, this is the building. It looks very familiar, right? It looks like the domino house, but with a twist, right? So 
your columns are no longer solid, right? They are inhabitable spaces. You can enter the column. Sometimes it's a lip core, sometimes it's a space, right? And these columns, these pilotis, they are irregular, right? Um, narrow and then not straight up, right? Slanted. And then you still have these planes, right? So Ito is really trying to break um, the domino house diagram, right? After all, it's been a hundred years, right? So Ito made this building. It's a media tech, and you can see in his um, concept design, right? So all these are like dancing columns, but most importantly, these columns are also inhabitable. So here you can see, so this is the lift, this is the staircase, and the rest are just spaces, right? So you no longer have the solid void because now everything is a space first. And if you look at the plans, right, they are not exactly the ABAB -A -B grid that you get from uh, the, the, the modernist era, right? So they are a little bit more fluid. And then you have this big spaces, right? Uh, this is how it looks like. And this didn't, well, he's aware of, um, yeah, he's aware of the Western history and theory, but I think more importantly, they came from the Japanese and the Eastern philosophy, right? So um, if you look at some of the Japanese sculpture dated AD 200, right? So Japanese culture kind of begin in a very abstract manner. They are not optical like the Western, right? Like they, during the eras of... Uh, Renaissance and Michael Angelo, they try to depict what you see, right? So what you see, and then that's how they sculpt, right? But from the beginning, the Japanese culture, they went quite abstract, right? So this, this person is not real, doesn't look real, right? It's an abstract form of a human being, right? Dancing, right? So in Kenzo Tange's paper uh, on Katsura, he he traced some of this um, abstract quality and tradition back to the Yayoi. So there's Jomon and then Yayoi, these two, Jomon, J-O-M-O-N, and Yayoi. These two uh, ancient cultures, indigenous cultures from Japan, right? So they, there's a lot of references made to this culture. And then if we look at the Shinto shrine, Izumo, um, you can see, right, that this is uh, the shrine and then it's a four square grid, right? So four square grid meaning there's a column in the middle as opposed to a Renaissance uh, church, right, where it's always a, sp a space down the middle and that's where you enter and then that's how the whole symmetry of the building is being set up, right? So in a four square grid, usually it's not used for classical formal building in the West, right? But in the East, you started asymmetrically, right? So having a column in the middle means you have to enter on the side, which then upsets the whole symmetry of the building, okay? But this is common in, uh, in the Japanese culture, right? So you can, this is Issei Shrine, another shrine, which, which also has the four square grid. And a lot of this got to do with the construction. So they are all timber based. So usually they will set up the middle column first to hold up the roof and then they will build top down instead of bottom up like Parthenon where you stack marble, right? And then if you look at, um, this is a heating device in a Japanese home, right? Uh, so this is actually a charcoal pit, right? So this is how uh, Japanese heat up their their body, right? And this is a kotatsu. So you will sit around and you put your legs inside, right? So this is another Asian idea where when you are warm, you basically, they heat up their hands and their feet only, right? But in a Western way, when you design aircon, you heat up the whole entire space, right? So this is a little bit like acupuncture, if you know, right? So instead of, um, uh, versus, say, chemotherapy, where you kill everything. This is really treating certain nodes, right? So these are fun fundamental philosophical cultural differences between the East and the West.
right? And then if we look at uh, some castle, another former imperial architecture, um, it's also not symmetrical. It's not central, right? It's made of, um, it's asymmetrical and then it's quite organic. And usually it's because they will want to go around a lake or some nature, found nature, okay? So of course you are familiar with Katsura, right? It's the same idea because of the lake and certain landscape, right? So it's okay, it's not about. So there's certain balance between man-made stuff and nature as well. And tatami, right? I can, as you can see, and this kind of growth into a certain size, right? It's the same module, but the way you propagate and then you get bigger and bigger spaces, right? So these are all ideas that is embedded in the Japanese thinking, okay? And then even the roof, right? So it's never one big block of um, uh, marble, right? Like Parthenon, right? One block of marble is one, the column for the column is 1.9 meter in diameter, right? But here, something big is usually made out of some small like parts, right? Very lightweight. And then it's um, variations of a same module. And obviously not every module is the same, but they belong to kind of the same family, okay? And then if we look at Jeffrey Bauer um, from Sri Lanka, right? You can also see, so this is uh, his house and it's also quite amazing. So um, you can't actually uh, describe the experience of this house is from, by looking at the plan, right? So even the photos, right? So there's always, um, it's like a maze. So basically every corner you turn and then there's something happening. Like here, there's a skylight and then at the back, there's another skylight, right? So looking at plan really doesn't tell you much about the spatial quality. And you can spend hours and hours in this house because it's like a maze. Like you think you discover a new corner, but actually you just left that room, right? So there's a lot of, um, it's like slums if you want, right? There's the, the spatial uh, diversity that you can get in this house, right? But if I studied this um, based on nine square grade or, or four square grade, you won't get your A, B, A, B, A. You won't get something very rigid, right? So formally, it's not so uh, controlled, but spatially, it is very, very diverse, right? Almost like you going into the forest, right? No two corners are the same, right? So how do we... Um, so these are very Asian um, qualities, right? So you can see from this photo, like even videos, you it's very hard to describe this this house, right? So these qualities are very common in Asia, right? Uh, and then in 2004, Sana built this museum, right? So you can see that the corridors, there's a lot of corridors. Basically every space is surrounded by corridors, right? Uh, normally in a museum, you would have one corridor and then this corridor would lead down the aisle and you look at the galleries in a linear sequence, right? But this, like the Bawa house, is designed to be uh, 24 hours open, right? So the neighborhood, they will always, you can walk through the museum. Only the middle part, I think, is ticketed. You have to pay tickets. But otherwise, you can always take a shortcut through the museum. So you will walk there. You will walk through the museum like almost every day, right? So as a result, it doesn't make sense to make something that is uh, sequential or with a linear sequence. Right, so they designed something like that with different sizes and rooms and then different paths. So you can, it's like a slum. It's like you can, the forest where you can walk through, choose your path, change your path every day, right? And then also they are designing, you know, like the smallest room here and then to the biggest rooms, right? So there's a variety of uh, gallery spaces and proportion. So do whatever, you want, you know, so if you have a small artwork, choose the small room, right? So there's a diversity, you can see in the section, you can, there's a diversity of uh, volumes and spaces that you can choose from. And the most important thing is, right, so this Western idea of service and serve space, right? So it's always hierarchical. There's the main spaces served by the corridors, which is like secondary spaces, right? So you always have main and secondary spaces. So here, what Sana is saying is that 
hey, no, there's no more such hierarchy because going to a museum in the 21st century is slightly different, right? Yeah, the artworks are very important, but so is the after events of going to a museum, right? So you can see here where the corridors are a bit wider. This is where you can have after parties, right? And then this, uh, you can talk to somebody in the socialize in all these corridors, right? So in this model, um, you no longer have this kind of hierarchical spaces, right? It's some, another term that you will hear quite often, right? So that is, this is non-hierarchical spaces and it's very difficult in architecture to achieve that because for the major part of um, the history, is, architecture has always been hierarchical, okay? So this is how the museum is sitting in a neighborhood. This is a neighborhood where uh, it's an old samurai neighborhood, right? So all this current residency will just take a shortcut across the museum, right? And then you can also see that this circle, right? Then obviously this circle is not supposed to be there. It's just to keep the air conditioning in, right? And uh, uh, the, the materials are very plain because it's supposed to take in the different seasons, right? It's supposed to reflect different seasons. Okay, and then they also did uh, Oriyama House around the same time, right? So instead of building, this is this is the project itself, right? Instead of building ten apartments, so like a apartment block, they broke down the whole in, uh, ten apartments into these small little volumes. Again, there are different volumes, right? And the uh, spaces in between the volumes are also very important because that's where you have your barbecue or your outdoor kitchen, right? So if you want, you can go and study. But again, a kind of a diversity of uh, spaces and how there's no longer the surf and the service space, both are as important, right? So this is, you can visit if you want. This is how it looks like, right? So instead of imagining a big apartment block with a corridor and then serving uh, five units on one floor, right? So they came up with something like that. And this is a museum in Mexico by Torito, also made of this little different, uh, different cells and I think more like different curved walls of different sizes, right? It looks like that. Oh, so this is a, geometrical transformation if you want. And these are the all the walls, okay? So basically, again, right? So if you want classical architecture, there's always black and white, one and zero, solid void, right? Or basic geometry, like in this. And then when you go to modernist, right? They broke up the circle. So you have arches, you have planes, you no longer have like pure shapes. Right, then you have your, and these are being uh, scattered around the grid, right? So elements and grid. And then now we are going to this kind of uh, spectrum and um, topological thing, right? So you have small triangle all the way up to the big triangle, small rectangle, a small circle to big circle, right? So you are trying to be more like nature. So if nature that's unlimited, every tree is different, unlimited possibility and then uh, classical modernists they have limited and maybe this era is trying you can never be like nature but you can say maybe increase your uh, variety of spaces to 50 I don't know something that the computer so it's something that the computer can help us with right so you, you, you imagine growing forms of the same family um, it can be endless as many as you want and this is what uh, grasshopper can uh, help us with, right? So mathematical series and family, this is what it is, right? So endless, right? But it's the idea of then maybe just varying the density. What are your variables? What are What is this algorithm that bound the whole family together, right? So already in 1968, uh, artists like Solo, right? They create art in this way, right, in a series form, or sculpture, right? So variations of the incomplete open cubes. And uh, another idea, so basically, there's some mathematical algorithms that is shared 
So it's like the mathematical DNA that's shared by this whole family of forms right, in grasshopper. So there's this famous um, drawing of what is topology, right? So a uh, donut and a cup, a coffee cup, they are basically the same, right? So you can kind of imagine this is a dough, right? And you mold, 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 uh, just enlarging the hole and basically you'll get a donut, okay? So they are the same. So they look different, but they belong to the same DNA, if you want. Because now the description of geometry has changed from geometrical to mathematical, okay? Okay, so this is very form focused, but we are in an era where, you know, can, we are trying to create um, parametric uh, space instead, right? So what is parametric space? So we, are, we keep looking at cladding and things, the solid of architecture, the object, right? And then what is space? So if we, so Dorito did this house that's built in 1976 for his sister, what you? The house is very simple. It's just a U-shape like that, right? But you look at the space that's, and there are three skylights, I think. I think one here, one here. There are three skylights, right? So basically the lights, they will change the spaces inside. And there's no partition, so-called, but just because the walls are bent, right, you will get division of spaces. It's not one round, right? But here, so this is another skylight you can see, right? So the light, they change the quality of the spaces inside. Okay, so you can see how this happens, right? So you will get a variety of spaces within a very simple geometry, right? So instead of like repeated spaces like the, the modernist era or the metaverse era, right? The mass production era. You, and then he also just completed this a few years ago, Tajong Library. Um, it's based on Bonoy cells, but the whole point is that the structure system is kind of simple, like in this diagram, right? And then they envision it using some tensile fabric material, right? So this is the sketch sections. Uh, but what you are getting is all these curved walls. So there's no more pilotes or anything, right? There are all these cells and curved walls. And of course, the invention of technology that allows us to build that. And this is from uh, highway retaining wall, right? Where they spray the concrete onto meshes, right? Like reinforce uh, meshes, right? Instead of pouring, instead of building. So the formwork is a soft mesh formwork, right? So um, this is uh, Hiroshi, Senju, Baisana. They are all built around the same time, having wow. the same idea, right? This building sits on a, uh, on a sloping ground, so three meter and so, but basically the whole museum, uh, there's no horizontal, flat horizontal surfaces, okay? You will see the artwork, you can't tell from the photographs, but basically all these are sloping, right? So you get, and then you have lights, and so you have a, uh, it's like walking through the landscape with different light and shadow, okay? So these are a diversity of, um, uh, spaces and they are non uh, partition uh, spaces, right? So you basically you are roaming into the architecture, like it's they're trying to blend it with the landscape, right? And then they also built Rolex um, in Lausanne, right? So this is a big scale one. So you can see now, you see the plan, it's a series of contours, right? It's this like no grid. Uh, it's very hard, right? But you can describe it in terms of contour, you can describe it in terms of density and uh, aggregation, you know, so all these new vocabs coming up, right? Uh, from here, right? And you can see how uh, the other thing about this uh, Asian architects is that don't, they don't theorize so much, so it's very hard to study. But uh, Nishizawa said before that, you know, they are, um, trying to create landscape like architecture. And also funny enough to him, the Patilun is actually a building that is conceived as a landscape. Okay. So, so anyway, and then finally we have uh, Ishigami's kite workshop. 
right? So the columns, uh, I think most of you know this building, the columns are scattered like that, right? There's no grid, but it's again a, like a, like trees in the forest, right? So some parts you have more open and some parts more dense. And if it's dense enough like here, then you can't walk through, then it becomes a wall, right? And this is the whole chart of, whole series of columns, uh, different sizes, different directions, right? And then he studied then the uh, people inhabiting that space, um, and then akin it to uh, birds and swarming, right? But this building is not created using uh, algorithms, right? This is Ishigami adjusting. So sometimes he talks about forests and birds and then galaxy, right? It doesn't quite matter what this thing looks like or what it's based on, but uh, the fact is that this is based on a different organization principle than grids and things like that, right? Then, of course, you can't question also, because of that, you can't also question, like, why do you choose this forest? Why this particular instance of this forest, right? But mm, do we want to question that? I don't know. We are still in the midst of this era, right? But the whole point is, um, when you look at this building from the outside, it looks very normal. It's just glass facade, as opposed to the Gary or the Zaha Hadid building before, right? But when you go inside, you can spend quite a bit of time inside, right? Because of you, you know, you can, you can, if you want, you know, try the open area and then different densities of the area, and then you can roam. And every time you come in, you can cut across the building in a different way, right? So like really like going through the forest. Right, so they are uh, so for this whole era, to 2000 to 2013, the Japanese architects they are creating something that is not so optical, but structurally a little bit more dynamic than what Gary and Za did have created. Right, those are more optical and for different reasons. Okay, uh. This is just a reading. I don't know. This is just my reading of this era. And then if we look at uh, also art, because they are always a little bit ahead of us, of uh, us meaning architecture, um, you'll see, you know, the first project in Tate Modern in London is trying to create sunset, sun rain, right? Or like James Joel using light as a sculpture material, right? So even the sculptors, the artists, they are trying to find new dynamic materials to, to, to kind of use them, right? We are done with the, the steel, we are done with the stone, and we are done with all this uh, rigid material, so-called, right? And they are trying to create something that's natural. So very much like architecture, right? Going, going to nature, to find some sort of new organization methods, right? So this is where maybe the East and the West meet, I don't know, right? This uh, Deleuze uh, writing about a thousand plateaus in 1980, right? Uh, if you want, you can read, right? So it's pretty much like based on, um, uh, so traditional systems are more centralized, right? So now he's suggesting that, um, we are going to, towards decentralized and distributed system, right? So centralized, and this is not just architecture, we're talking about politics, we're talking about banks, we're talking about country borders, right? The whole history of humankind, right? So there's always a centralized authority and then hierarchical control. So that's what we call a tree structure on the left, right? So, um, and then he's talking about nomadic society compared he was comparing like nomadic society to sedentary, right? Where there's always power. So nomadic society, you don't really have hierarchy. It is more like rhizomes. So that's why a, a thousand plateaus, right? And then you don't have axes. You don't have control. And then you always, every season, the nomads, they find some new ways to cut across the plains and it's guided by where there's water, you're guided by stars, you're guided by a lot of other things other than this pre-planned top-down uh, system and order, right? And then another diagram, right? So these are, you can see uh, commonly in organization chart of companies, right? Where there's a boss and then, so 
three type um, hierarchical organization is in every aspect of our society. And the loose is talking about this rhizome type, right? So until uh, the recent cryptocurrency, right? So that is something that is happening because of uh, computer, right? So that is a non, uh, how to say, non, non, is the first decentralized financial system or currency that we have, right? So there's a lot of, they are still, I mean, cryptocurrency and Bitcoin is like 10 years old. So we are also still in this current era, right? But basically you have an alternative system to the tree type that has been governing our society. Okay, then, okay, so more art by Eva Hess, right? So again, you can see um, this ver ver variations, this series, if you want, right? And I want to just show you her sculpture, right? So this is, yeah, this is latex, but basically the mold is always the same, but because of the nature of the material, every one of the cylinder, they turn up slightly different, okay? And why maybe this is related to our current exercise, right? Um, so of course, computer is like a catalyst for all this to happen. But many, many years back, this is Gaudi. This is a model by Antonio Gaudi. So if you are looking at, uh, you're looking at uh, Sagrada Familia in Barcelona, right, in Spain, right? So he's he's trying to design all these arches, right? That's all different. So if you think of the, the Roman arches, they are always the same, right? So not so many, but here he is designing all the arches to be different, right? So he made this chain model, right? What is this chain model? So this is the natural force where the, the force diagram, right? So, and then he will, build this upside down, and then you can see this mirror at the bottom, right? So if you look into the mirror, then you will see the, the spire of the church, right? Right side up, okay? So basically there was no rhino, there's no grasshopper. Um, this is in 1800, I think, yeah, 100 years ago, right? So they use dynamic model, like realized dynamic model and all this modern material, to help them find form, but of course they are not the, this is not the dominant uh, trend of the time, right? But now it's very relevant to us, right? Another architect, this is Fred Otto, right? Trying, uh, using, this is also chain. So this is another model that he's trying to find. Uh, actually you have to look at it the other way up as well, right? So um, this is bubble, okay? Using different, frames and using bubble because bubble gives you the minimum surface right of all this uh roof or coverings right so this uh i think for munich we yeah, have the stadium for munich right so he's using tensile fabric and bubbles to help him find form so not rigid materials like a block of wood or foam or steel okay and then of course now 100 over years later we can do this using grasshopper kangaroo, right? So grasshopper is like invented in, I think, 2013, less than 15 years, right? So they are still developing a lot of plugins that allows us to uh, match or do the physical materials, right? And if you, so this is Fred Otto's book, if you're interested, he has a book, right, where he documented all the models that he used to find the other order or the other systems, right? So this is using some foam, and then needle, some weight, right? So he designed his model, but and then he would have these floating foams, right? Or the bubbles doing this, right? So how do you uh, look at, generate the bubbles, right? And then this kind of diagram, and then he draws them, and actually he's drawing Voronoi, uh, or packing, right? Packing regular packing order versus Voronoi or how in again this you can easily do it in Grasshopper now right um, and then using bubble again but the organization system is different because here he's looking at flocking right so uh, attractors so these are more like flocking around the uh, or something 
right? So then he tries to draw them realistically. So this is how it looks like, but or using some powder, and, right? But this is actually a tractor, right? So different fields and uh, something that you can model now easily on Grasshopper as well. So I think we are still in this era where there's a lot to explore. They are all natural dynamic system. And then some you can model them on Grasshopper, but some will be a bit difficult, like fluid dynamics, right? Or, but then, uh, so some realistic model, and then you have to translate into the field, the striation geometry, and then forces, right? And then how this dynamic forces actually deform a material, which is what uh, we are doing now, right? So I will run through very quickly because don't know, and they are, these are some of the works generated by your past years, right? Like studying um, sedimentation and erosions. And then, you know, so we have to go back and forth between physical modeling and uh, dynamic uh, digital modeling, right? So, and then, so, I mean, if Prioto and Gaudi, they can do it a hundred, over a hundred years ago, there's nothing stopping you from doing it now. And you have the help of Grasshopper, but it also, says, it also tells you that even if you're not very interested in digital modeling, you can still use uh, this physical model, modeling material to help you find other systems, right? Find, find new forms, basically. Okay, so I can, yeah, I'll just go through very fast, but these are some, uh, I don't know, small, I mean, how do you draw them in a, in a way that, you know, it's not realistic, but trying to describe the forces in the system, right? So there are ways, like, so we can use mesh, you can use nerves, contour line, and all these points, right? And then you can look at swarm intelligence, right? So birds, these are birds, uh, fly path, right? So you have a long time lapse and it describes, you see, different birds, right? They, so how can we turn this kind of uh, dynamic system into architecture and something that is not just a pattern or a cladding on the facade, but something that really uh, affects the structure, right? So some of this modeling, digital modeling capability came from, a lot of them came from the movie industry. So this is Batman, right? They have to model bats flying out, right? So this is based on some, uh, and then a lot of the rain, right? So you can't have a repeated, repeated person, right? So how do you animate this? A lot of this, they come from that. And then if you want to model, um, What's that? Fluid dynamics now. There's there's a plugin called Flex Hopper on Grasshopper, but uh, it's not real. It's still not real physics model. It somewhat talks about certain uh, relationship, but it's not a real physics model. So the physical material they still model. They still give you um, the real physics. Yeah. So these are simulation still, right? And then depending on how powerful your computer is. So you have, you can study rhizomes, you can study emergent and fractal, right? So this is another plugin in Grasshopper also allows you to do that now. You can do aggregation and randomize your aggregation, right? And that's how snowflakes are formed. Okay, I think I'll stop here because yeah, there's no conclusion that needs a lot. <laughs> Yeah. Cool. Okay. Can we really see if there are any student questions? Otherwise, they'll just see my question. Mm -hmm. No. You know, uh, so you were talking about um a Sorry, very I simple transition. I have a question. Yeah, okay. mm -hmm. Yes. Uh so uh I realize that a lot of the examples mentioned are more eastern in nature. So uh, when it comes to like the Western world of architecture, what do you think are some architects that best demonstrate some of this more like organic and also like linear shape thinking? Uh? Yeah. Don't have a thing. They are still pretty much focused on the, the parts and the component. They are very form focused. Yeah. Philip Ram? Philip Ram is not there. Philip Ram. Who? 
Philip Ram, the street architect who is studying Philip. Uh, Oh, who's voice? Hello? Very noisy, that okay. class, very noisy. Yeah. I think Philip Ram is doing interesting work. I think uh, So Ail in New York is doing interesting work. Philip Ram is Swiss. Um, so there are uh, Western concept, conceptual, maybe not English primary language, but there are uh, European architects out there who are also dealing with phenomenology, uh, atmospherics, uh, thinking about uh, computational fluid dynamics that are not just to serve efficiency, but also to serve a design concept or a, a kind of desired outcome or a spatial uh, experiential uh, uh, qualitative uh, uh, outcome. It's not necessarily all mathematical um, as well, I, I want to say, right, sir? Well, I think there are now it's like everyone you just try your own path, right? <laughs> Whatever you believe in. Because um, we are still really very young. This is like 10 years old, but architecture history is like thousands of years, right? So mm. you, uh, for me, because the, the education background is very Western and then when I finally graduated and then went to visit some of these buildings in Sri Lanka and Japan, something just don't click, right? So, and mm. then, all these things they don't they don't teach in my school, right? Which is and then but you know there's something that is very different. So this is what I put together. Yeah. What I think. Yeah. So yeah, I don't know. But okay. for me, yeah, for me, um what the problem is really we are no longer at this era, right? Where you will build so many iconic buildings and things like that, right? And then the predominant language is actually Domino House, which is about 100 years old, right? But we don't get the good Domino House of Kobu or the modernists. We get the repeated Domino House, right? And then so you have all these spaces everywhere you go. Every HDB is the same and all this repeated stuff. So if this parametric thinking doesn't get to a structural level or get to a level where we can build them cheaply, then maybe every city only has one of this building, you see, right? So maybe the question is, how do we build a, a very complex spaces, very spaces which are very complex and diverse so that your spaces are interesting, your city is interesting, right? Um, but then in a simple method, simple form, right? So of course, like Federico, they were talking about robotics and all this, right? So maybe you cannot think of this kind of big parts. You really have to build smaller parts, right? And then simple parts that can be built cheaply, but then give rise to spatial quality that's like slums, very, very diverse. That is like, but, but logically, that is very difficult, right? It's like, it's so hard to... It's expensive. It will be expensive to mass customize, right? And therefore, this this domino house has been around forever and ever. And uh, yeah, so we are at that stage, you see. So otherwise, every city like our city, right? Ninety nine percent, you still get all these repeated homogeneous spaces, but you get one or two buildings, right? Uh, so that's the that's a challenge, yeah. Earlier, you mentioned uh, the shift from parametric form into parametric space, and then from parametric space into fluid dynamic space, right? But in the latter two of parametric and computational fluid mm. space, we still need forms to contain or define those spaces, right? So are you suggesting that the nomadic direction would be an inverse or invisible or uh, what, where is the function of forms in parametric space and fluid dynamic space? Okay, the fluid dynamic space, like all the systems that I talked about in the last part, right? That all the different systems can be applied to form or the space, which means the, the solid or the void, right? Mm -hmm. So if, if you want this to become... So if you don't have a budget issue, it's okay to... Every cladding, you know, different, every structure, every piece is different, right? 
But mm. if we want this to affect more change, right, then it's about how you design, how this thing can be simply built, but by combinations and propagation, you get very complex spaces. But the form is simple. It's not a must, but I think that is the only way that it can uh, replace domino house diagram. Mm. So you are saying that parametric form and parametric space can be seen as inverse relations to each other. They are not necessarily progressive or, yeah. or different. Yeah, it's just how to move forward, you see. So after, you see, the problem is after you're done with all this, uh, this 10 years of architecture, right, where we have the projects and the, the cities have the money because of the boom in China, right, and or uh, Middle East, right, then what, then now we can't, so all these cities, everyone's bankrupt, they can't build all these iconic buildings anymore, right, then what, and then yeah. it doesn't also uh, change a lot of the everyday uh, housing, right, or technology, you see. So it's just, a, in, a, in a way, it's progressive uh, linearly like that. There's a question in the chat group uh, with reference to the KIT workshop. How were they able to make the connection of movement of people? They're making movement of birds. Oh, this is post. This is post, okay? This is um, him. So if you look at, these Japanese architects, they don't use grasshopper for most of them. So they, they use free interns. <laughs> they use life size modeling because they have free interns, right? So they use, they build life size model and it's uh, the Ishigami there tweaking, you know. So that's why if you look at this plan, right? Sometimes some books, right? He said, oh, it is uh, like a forest. And sometimes then he will show you uh, it's stars and galaxy. The point is, it doesn't matter what it looks like, right? The point is that you will give rise to this kind of randomness and random spaces, right? So the birds part, this is post. So after his building is built, he put CCTV and he studied how people move and how to understand whether people like spaces with more columns or less columns, mm. right? So he and said, it, it looks mm. like, it feels like it's bird flocking but they don't really translate the, the, the physics because they don't use grasshopper. But what I'm saying is that with grasshopper and the development of all these new plugins, right, a lot of these relations we can already simulate very simply. So if you look at birds flocking, it's very complex because there's temperature, there's a lot of things that is going to crash our computer, right? But do we need to really look like birds? No, right? We can just think of buildings like different density of flocking, right? We don't actually need the real physics modeling, you see. Yeah. But so I this is... The, make, make a difference maybe between the... Because like you mentioned earlier, uh, many of these architects in Japan don't theorize their work in the same similar fashion, uh, in a similar manner that the Western architects do. Uh, so a lot of this is also your kind of your own postulation, right? And, and your own yeah. kind of hypothesis that this is what uh, you see a, a certain kind of trend in the Japanese architecture moving towards. But yeah. it doesn't necessarily mean that they do work with those themes and methods. It just happens to have this commonality that's running through it. Yeah, that's right. Because they are for only, they want to be more like nature, right? Which is in their tradition. But then it's like, where the, can I really, it's invalid la, for me to question Ishigami. Eh, so is it looking like forest or is it looking, is it stars? Or can it doesn't matter. But at the, like, yeah, but the, at the same time, it's also very uh, misleading. If that is the case, like taken at face value, it can seem very metaphorical, you know? Yeah, like the Ito building, he said seaweed. It's like, why seaweed? What has the media tech got to do with seaweed? You can look, you can see it looks like, so they are basically not metaphorical in nature. The, the way they think they are abstract. They right? are. Yeah. Are they are so they not? They are they are abstract. So they don't they say whatever, it doesn't matter. They just they don't really describe, right? But yeah, they are not. Uh, the, the culture is very abstract. Yeah. They don't care whether that's why looking like what doesn't matter to them. So I'm saying mm. like, I mean, we are all still in the middle of this, right? So these are the tools that can do some things. 
first you know the mm. tools you are you guys should be the generation right to decide what you want to do with it what you can create with it because you have these new tools it's not like saying um classical is bad or whatever but it's been done before it's been done for thousands of years so there's little room for i think 99 i wouldn't say no but like little room for innovation right? if you find those terms right like modernist right everybody post mod right try to do something in reaction to modernist right then all of a sudden you have a new tool right so modernist also in comparison to classical era right because of concrete and steel so you will invent your own language right so now we have a new tools new technology we should be able to invent new languages uh, and that's where new mm. architecture will come out right so don't know there's no conclusion every semester we are don't know i'm doing different same same but different things right then we are hoping to find more systems and ho hoping to uh, find more ways that we can control and measure the dynamic systems right so and then eh, uh, you know like uh, and it's also you know then all of a sudden eh, you have this plugin then that you can you can use and then you're like oh, okay so i don't need to use a physical material anymore but you know but there's this gap and i think it's fun to have the gap that's why we still have this exercise right where you just hmm. use yeah i think in a way it is. also gives us an opportunity to translate very abstract and very, very database very dynamic very diverse very divergent you know sets of information that are coming in in very complex ways that we cannot fully understand and that's why we have to turn to a higher power whether it's nature or higher powered laptop or higher computational power to help make sense of it right yeah yeah so okay yeah. anyway the plugins they they a lot of them they created because of they understood certain natural material first then say okay yeah. we need to write this plugin so that we can simulate this you see so mm. we will if you just go the digital way then you are kind of they are controlled by your computer you know yeah. mm. Mm. okay okay thanks very much sai for doing this year end lecture <laughs> year end lecture <laughs> Um, otherwise, we are back in studio. I think in about five or ten minutes, everyone takes a, a quick break and then we can uh, get back to studio and uh, I think we'll see each other at the final review in two weeks' time. Okay. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Sai. All right. Okay. Thank you. All right. Yeah.